Hi, I'm Vic Serpina. I'm a professor of medicine at University of Texas in Galveston, professor of family medicine and integrative medicine. Also a uh, diplomat of the Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine and the Board of Family Medicine. I'm going to talk a little bit about health care reform today. There's so much in the news and I wanted to just kind of give us a little bit perhaps different perspective on it. Uh, this would include a vision of what the doctor of the future might look like, some issues about workforce imbalance, and environmental concerns. So here's the doctor of the future, right? You've got somebody's going to look a little different than they do now. Okay, so I, I put this into two columns, process and structure. So in the future, we're going to be increasingly patient-centered. And the doctor, in terms of the system, is going to be more of a health system navigator than he or she is now. The process will be more team-based and outreach-oriented and much more multidisciplinary and collaborative. We'll have both high-tech and high-touch with conscious healing, a conscious design of the healing environment. The process of individualization or personalization of medicine using genomics and functional medicine will increasingly be penetrated based on evolving scientific principles. And this also requires us to train doctors in different ways, in a system biology approach and complexity theory rather than linear, this problem leads to this diagnosis, leads to that drug. So the complexity of looking at the whole person and the ecological perspective. Uh, the doctor of the future will also be kind of upstream from disease by being prospective and preventive and really looking earlier in the course of people's lives to prevent disease from arising. This reminds us, us of the Chinese aphorism that says the best doctor treats the disease before it occurs. And also we'll be looking at quality and outcomes focus. We won't just get paid for seeing more patients, but really we'll be tying our reimbursement to the quality and outcome that we see, and this will be evidence-based. There'll be more healing, more uh, evidence on self-healing and homeostasis. The idea of the doctor as the mechanic, the person as a machine, is, is already obsolete and antiquated. And, the, and we have to return to the fact that the body heals itself and we just need to help with that. So this requires empowering the patient, educating them. We can use web-based resources, health coaching, and other mechanisms to, pur to uh, purpose that, fu that future. Natural treatments, nutrition, botanicals, lifestyle, mind-body, complementary alternative therapies. These are inexpensive. These are l less invasive. These are the kinds of treatments we really will start with first rather than end up with those when everything else has failed. Another big thing is we're going to move out of the office and out of the hospital and the community into the school. We'll become the patient's advocate and activist to help them, for example, helping children eat healthier lunches at school working with churches to develop fitness programs. So this doctor is going to be integrative and he or she is going to be very involved as well in social environmental policy change and self-care strategies. So this is how we're going to evolve. Now nothing less than our health is in the balance. Right now our burden of expense in our health care system is huge. It just costs us too much money. The U.S. spends on average twice as much as the closest country in the, wor in the developed world, somewhere around seven or eight thousand dollars a person per year compared to other countries like Germany or, or Great Britain. And our outcomes are worse. We're actually number 38th in the world, right behind Albania or somebody like that in terms of patient outcomes. And part of the issue is that we have overloaded our system with specialists. Instead of a peer in which primary care is at the base and the specialty uh, is up at the top, more than two-thirds of our doctors are specialists. And this is a more expensive form of care. And most systems that do have a uh, universal health care system and access, it's the opposite. The primary care uh, is the driver and goes the other way to the specialist. So this is kind of the balance is tipping here. And that's where it's a lot less expensive. And it's more preventive, more health promotive. And this is, in all of our discussion in, the, in this country about the politics and how, pay, how payment will be made and who's going to have access, we've left this part out. We have left very little focus on redistributing the workforce. And it's estimated there's 60 to 80,000 uh, deficiency in number of primary care doctors. 
And even if every graduate or every medical school in the country went into primary care in the next 10 years, we wouldn't solve that problem. So we've got a long ways to go with this, and we need help from our CAM practitioners, from our nurse practitioners, from our physician's assistants, and also from the system itself to encourage students to go into primary care because one of the reasons they don't is because they come out of school with $200,000 debt and they say, well, I'm gonna go for the specialty care that pays two or three times as much per year. And so they're not, they're not encouraged by the nature of our healthcare and education system. This is a quote from one of my childhood heroes, Thomas Edison. I used to keep this on my wall in medical school. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patients in the care of the human frame in a proper diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. So I modify this a little bit because I do, I do give some medicine. The doctor of the future will give some medicine and will interest his or her patients in the care of human frame. And this is the essential place that we really do need to get to. Part of it is how we eat. The basis of good health is good nutrition. These are the uh, 14 superfoods, been most researched. These, this group of foods has clear health benefits, and yet it's a smaller part of our American diet because of the way that agriculture is reimbursed and because of our, our cultural habits. This is a, an issue that I, I feel is important for us to think about. We have been reimbursing the uh, our agricultural industry for many years to the tune of 50 or more billion dollars and basically we're not supporting ma and pa farms we're su we're supporting giant agribusinesses like this uh, hog farm down here or this monoculture of corn or the cattle feeding place the result is like supersize me the average obesity rate down in the, in the country or overweight is over 60 percent like that movie you should see that sometimes the guy that ate uh, at McDonald's for 30 days straight and gained about 30 pounds. The upper left is, a, is what we call dead zones. That red area is areas where there's not enough oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico to, su to sufficiently provide uh, nutrition for fish. And the reason is because all of these farms up in the Midwest and so forth, they're effluent and their fertilizers have gone into the Mississippi created a uh, fertilizer over, overdose to the Gulf of Mexico. All these phytoplankton grew, grow up, use up the oxygen, the fish die off, so the shrimp and fishing industries are probably more threatened by this than the Horizon uh, Gulf uh, oil explosion. So <clears throat> this is some in interesting information I picked out of Time Magazine a couple years ago. Because our agricultural policies are feeding our obesity, one of the issues is that poor quality foods cost less, and poor people then buy the cheaper foods. So a dollar will buy you about 1,200 calories in chips, 1,200 calories, 875 calories of Coke, that's Coca-Cola, but only 250 calories of broccoli or other vegetables, 170 calories of oranges or blueberries or fresh fruit. So there's a big disparity. So if someone's already overweight, they want to keep their weight up, they're going to continue to spend their dollar on the high calorie junk food. And this is a tragedy in our society and we're now seeing results of it with childhood obesity, kids under 10 getting type two diabetes because they're just eating the wrong way and not exercising. So here's some little recommendations here that I hope will help change our system. <clears throat> First of all, we need to change our reimbursement for health care to support wellness promotion and prevention at a primary care level. Until we do this, nothing's really going to change. We're going to still see that scale of the specialty care raising the prices. And the interesting thing, the studies about specialty care, if there's more specialists in a community, the health care costs definitely go up, but the quality of life and the outcomes go down. And the reason is because they do more things that are dangerous to patients. So this has been well documented. And at the same time, if you have more primary care docs in an area, it reduces ER visits and costs, de decreases hospitalizations and the length of hospitalizations, increases overall health outcomes at a much lower cost. <clears throat> but that's got to have a, a change in reimbursement to sustain that. And we have to create time for meaningful medical encounters. Patients have complex problems. We can't really solve those in a five or 10 minute office visit. And if we're not getting paid 
uh, adequately to spend time with patients, but we're getting paid to do procedures. Like I can spend a half an hour with the patient discussing their diabetes and their hypertension, but if I take a wart off their, their foot, I'll get paid more for that wart, which takes me five minutes to remove, than the half hour that really makes more meaningful impact on their lives. So we also have to make it less costly for medical students to choose primary care. And as I mentioned, the, the health debt or the uh, student debt is enormous. Some kids are coming out of, out of college with $50,000 worth of debt, and then they're coming out of medical school with 200000 We have to stop subsidizing unhealthy foods at agribusinesses and at schools and encourage a culture of increased physical activity for, in the United States for children and adults. So these upstream changes are going to lower our, our downstream costs. And until we do them, we can argue all we want to about how much we're going to distribute this, uh, the money for this coverage or that coverage. But as long as the expenses keep going up, basically, we've got a body shop at the bottom of a cliff and we need a guardrail at the top. Thank you very much. <laughs>